What are you passionate about? What drives you? Who are you as a person? Because being in a kitchen when you're in such close proximity, it's hot as hell. We're moving very quickly. Like if you can't communicate with the person next to you and you there's tension that you just like just cut, it's like so thick, it's terrible for everybody. It's toxic. I, I care more about who you are as a person and like what are you passionate about and where do you see yourself? Hey, what's up, guys? This is Jordan Anderson, and welcome to episode two. This is a new series I'm starting where we talk with local creators, artists, and we really try to understand their process. So we got episode one out of the way. Here's episode two. This episode is with Johnny Sparrow, Chef Johnny Sparrow. And Chef Johnny Sparrow is a DC chef. He grew up in the Baltimore area. He's been to Spain. He's been to Copenhagen. He's now back in D.C. He's worked in several restaurants. When I initially booked with him, I didn't know that he was on a Netflix show called The Final Table, which is, I think, a competition show spinoff from Chef's Table. As I was recording the podcast, I knew about the Netflix show, but I felt like I didn't want to really bring it up because it's probably been brought up way too many times with other news reporters. So we recorded this podcast at Reverie, which is his seven-month-old D.C. restaurant uh, it's in Georgetown. It's off Gray Street, and you go down this cobblestone alleyway. The place is awesome. It's like you're in the you're in this very historic, you know, 1700s neighborhood. You go down the cobblestone into the restaurant, and then you walk into what just feels like this modern, you know, Swedish Nordic mid-century modern restaurant. It looks awesome. It's it's just like it's a mix of like bright blue colors and clean white walls and mid-century chairs and the kitchen is completely open um think the only way i can describe how open it is is like the like a sushi bar at a restaurant like you sit at the bar and you look across the glass and the chef is right there cutting your food prepping your food cooking your food and you can actually talk with them and that i think has kind of built into the culture that johnny set up at reverie we talk about that in the podcast. We talk about like how he treats his employees, how he kind of creates this group family dynamic with his employees. We recorded this in an active restaurant, so you might hear a little fan noise from the vents. I think the uh, I think a, a delivery guy came in. Um, I think there's also around minute 32. There's a blender that goes on because they were prepping for that that day's service. But I thought our conversation was uh, really worthwhile. Really, you know, there were a lot of great takeaways uh, if you are trying to get into the restaurant industry or even just understand how creativity works because there were a lot of overlaps. He said a lot of things that from a filmmaker's perspective, I experience just in a different way. So if you're listening to this episode and you think that this is just going to be food talk and talking about, you know, life of a chef, it is, but it's also much more than that. So I'll quit rambling. I've set this up for you guys. Let's get into it. I present to you, Chef Johnny Sparrow. Yes, we have Johnny Sparrow here on the podcast. Thanks for being here. Of course. Um, give us like a quick five minute kind of potted intro of yourself. Like you are a chef in DC, go. Cool. All right. <laughs> uh, so I'm Johnny Sparrow. I'm a chef here in Washington, DC. I've been here on and off for the past 12 years. Uh, I recently opened up my restaurant in Georgetown called Reverie Restaurant. Uh, it's small by comparison to most, 64 seats, uh, down a historic alleyway in a historic building. Uh, for most, probably not the most like ideal restaurant space, but we were drawn to it because of what it was, that it wasn't this prefabricated new build. It had history and being in Georgetown, one of the most you know beautiful parts of DC that will not change in our lifetime. It was important to me to find and find that. Uh, I started working here as a culinary school uh, extern back in, I guess, maybe 2006, 2007. Um, and then I've just kind of spent my time working in the restaurants that I thought were the best restaurants in DC. And I think um, definitely kind of, I followed their, I guess their, their culture more than anything. I worked at Comey um, in DuPont, which I still consider to be one of the best restaurants in DC. And I think most do. Um, I worked in Southern Virginia with John Shields, the townhouse and DC's kind of been my, 
my my home and my my the place that I always come back to and then I leave not thinking I was ever going to settle down here and uh yeah it just you when as long as I've been here I've seen relationship with chefs and farmers and just guests and everything kind of grow and grow and grow and I kind of took a step back and realized that DC is just like this incredible scene and I've built myself into this for the past you know decade and I've been a part of it growing not just an observer from the back like helping facilitate it and pushing it forward so uh, yeah, this is, this is what I've been doing for the past, you know, I mean, I've been working at restaurants since I was 15, but you know, the past decade or so I've been, uh, been really focused on, on the DC, uh, the DC area as my, my home. Let's go back to like when you were 15, what was the draw initially to the restaurant industry? Uh, so this is a, it's a, a pretty common story that I tell. And I think most people in the industry can relate to this is that I was a, a terrible kid. Uh, I just, I wasn't like disrespectful. I just, I always chose to go the other way when someone would tell me to do something. So, uh, I did terrible in school. Uh, I just, I had no real ambition or drive. And right around the time that we were, you know, I'm a triplet, we're all getting ready to take our, you know, driver's ed and get our driver's licenses. My parents had asked me, uh, like, listen, like you either need to get your grades up or you need to get a job if you want to get a car. Um, so of course I went to get a job because I didn't care about school at the time. I think I went to summer school every year from like sixth grade till I graduated high school barely graduated high school. So, uh, the job thing was the easiest one for me at that point. Um, I lived, uh, in a small little town called, it was Phoenix, Maryland, uh, close to Jacksonville, Maryland, which is always another tr preference point that like Phoenix, Arizona I was like, no, it's close to Jacksonville. No one has an idea. It's very close to like the Pennsylvania line. I, there was like a Buffalo farm we grew up next to. It was just, uh, there wasn't a lot of culture out there, Well, there was a shopping center with a Safeway, uh, a Rite Aid and in between was a restaurant uh, that had changed hands a number like a number of times from from even when I was little like growing up I think the restaurant I remember it being the most was called McCaws this dude had a parrot and named it after his parrot and the parrot would just like hang out in the dining room all night and like tear apart the chairs and like destroy it and now being a business owner I'm like shit I'm like that's someone broke a chair here and I got pissed I'm like let alone having my parrot like gnaw on it but that's what I remember that restaurant being and then it was reopening as an American Bistro. So I went in and I applied. Uh, I had no real job experience. I had done some stuff for like my parents had like hired me to do some maintenance stuff at uh, one of their offices. I cleaned like showers and gym locker rooms. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, cool, I'll just go work in a restaurant because it was literally right up the street. Um, and I got hired on the spot as a busboy because you walk in and the boss is like, what do you want to do here? Like, you, can you cook? Well, I, I walked in. I was playing? like, I'm looking for a job. He's like, cool. We need busboys. Like there wasn't even an option of like what I wanted to do yeah. because they're, they're like, do you have a resume? And I was like, what's that? I'm this many years old. I don't have anything. And it's just, it was they, like, I was, I mean, I was 15 and I probably looked like I was 10. Um, so I got hired as a bus boy. I started training a couple weeks later, uh, trying to carry trays. Like it was, I just remember like wearing my, I think I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's still in my parents' house. Like the, my, it's like this black polo shirt with like very loosely fitting khaki pants and dress shoes that were just gaudy and disgusting and uh trying to carry a big big tray of like uh number 10 cans of like tomatoes like this the big cans you see in the store they just stacked it up they're like okay pick it up off the stand and carry it down the down the restaurant or carry it back and at that point i was probably like barely like 120 pounds maybe like 115 it was just so small i'm like dude i'm like this is like half of my weight i don't work out uh, i played soccer like i wasn't wasn't a weightlifter so i I did it and it really got me into the industry and it was like, you know, late nights. So I was at school in the mornings and I'd work a couple shifts during the week and I'd get home at, you know, like, you know, 10 or like at the time, like 10 o'clock was like, it was crazy to be, I mean that now that's like early for me, but, um, I just like instantly was drawn to that industry. And within like a couple of weeks, I started spending more time in the kitchen. Uh, and I asked if I could actually just pick up some prep ships back there. Cause those were the, I was the youngest person that worked the front of the house. You had servers that had been working together at different restaurants around the area for a lot while. And I was just like this dumb young little skater kid who, uh, liked to cause trouble and, um, would ask them to buy me beer. But then I realized like that's what the kitchen does. So I was drawn for it, drawn to it for like the entirely wrong reason. Uh, I saw these guys like outside smoking cigarettes and drinking beer. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, this is what I like to do too. <laughs> uh, so, I ended up picking up a couple shifts working in the kitchen, uh, working like I started in the garbage station, which is like making like house salads and Caesar salads and microwaving baked potatoes. Well, I guess it's technically not a baked potato at that point, but, um, that was like my first experience in kitchen. Like I'm pretty sure I had 
like the baggy chef pants with like mushrooms and chili peppers on it at some point. Um, and I was just like instantly drawn to it. Like it, it, that was like my main focus. Like I, not to say I didn't care about anything else, but, um, it just seemed like it was like a constant party in the kitchen. It was just this, like nobody had any control over us. Like we obviously had a chef, but he like partied hard too. So nobody cared. Like we all got to drink beers in the parking lot at the end of the work, like, you know, under work, like smoke weed, just, it was, it was like, cool. Like this is, I was getting in trouble for wanting to do all this. I'm like, but now it's socially acceptable to be like after work to do all this. I'm like, okay. Um, but then I kind of started, to, <clears throat> I'd always been kind of like artistic and I loved music and, and I re never really found like any kind of way to, uh, I guess, direct that in any other part of my life. And I had no ambition to do anything professionally. Like I, my sister was getting ready to like, she was, she was in SAT prep. I was, I was told the day before that I was taking the SATs that my mom had signed me up. Like I just, I didn't really, not to say I didn't care, but I had no direction or push and not to say I had no, uh, goals, but I had no, I didn't know what I could do. Uh, I didn't have any, like a lot of options presented in front of me just for, I mean, I was not, I was not top of the class. So why would anybody pay attention to like, to the guy that was like constantly failing and just, I wasn't like a troublemaker as much. Like I just didn't really care about school. Um, so the, yeah, then you have like an organized idea or you're like, you have some ambition and they kind of yeah. like question that yeah. a little bit of like, yeah, yeah. Your track record proves otherwise. Yeah, exactly. And that, that was kind of what I fought with it for the first couple of years of like doing this. Like I, I kind of fell in love with it and I wanted to kind of keep pushing forward. And, um, I just found the one thing that took my attention. Everything else was like 30 seconds and I was like a goldfish and like being in the kitchen as I started, you know, getting into it a little bit more, kind of started like cooking at home with my family and I really enjoyed it. Like my grandmother <clears throat> before she had passed had always cooked dinner for our family. Like every Sunday she was from Latvia. Uh, it was very, you know, very simple, rustic, like peasant food. But I just remember like sitting there on Sundays and eating it and just like watching her in the kitchen. And like, I never cooked with her in the kitchen. Like most people have that like glorified story of like standing next to their grandmother while they're peeling garlic or whatever. Like, let me show you the yeah. way. No, she didn't show me. It was just, I just remember like the way that it made everybody feel like going over there every Sunday. And it was just, it was awesome. And I started like to find a connection with it. Um, but I had a lot of other friends that had kind of started working in kitchens in high school. And I was like, cool. I'm like, I want to do this for a career. I think there's, I started looking more into like the fine dining restaurants. Cause I was just tired of making, you know, creme brulee and Caesar salads, which Caesar salads are still like one of my favorite things. I just got tired of making them. Um, and I was looking at places, I mean, I was living in, looking in downtown Baltimore, which there was a couple things here and there. And I, I'd worked at a couple of places, but I wanted to kind of keep pushing forward and see what else was out there. Cause I, I realized like, you know, I'm, I live out in middle of nowhere, Maryland. Like this is not the epicenter of culture and the internet wasn't, you know, what it is now where you could just like Google anything and see Instagram geotags of restaurants, you know, in Copenhagen. I had been talking to my parents about trying to go to culinary school because I had one of my best friends at the time was going to go to Pittsburgh. I didn't, I had not applied to any colleges at this point. But we went through the entire application process. Like we had everything ready to go. Like I was going to live with my friend James and then we were going to go to school together. And then, I mean, who knows what it was. I was going to live in downtown Pittsburgh and it was going to be, it was going to be awesome. We did the tour. We did all the orientation stuff. And then uh, I th my parents kind of pulled it out. They're like, N we don't think that you're committed enough to do this. Again, you talk about like previous track records. Like why the hell would they pay tuition for me to go to a, like a school when they're like, this is probably just like a fad or like a phase that you're going through kind of thing. And at that point, like culinary was not as, um, it wasn't as glorified as it is now. And I mean, there were like, again, there's, there's always been like three Michelin star chefs, but it wasn't as easy accessible. Like for like my parents know who Rene Redzepi is now it's, it's out there and it's, it's in the world. Like people know it because of the media and yeah, the food network was probably not as big yeah. or travel channel or anything like yeah, that you, exposure of yeah. the lifestyle of a chef or the yeah. celebrity of a chef. Yeah. And I think what they, <clears throat> they're relate they're what they thought restaurants were, were, the American Bistro that I worked at where it's like, okay, you don't get paid a lot. You smoke cigarettes, you drink beer, you smoke weed, you do drugs. Like it's not that, why would you pay, why would we pay you to go like a school tuition to go like just continue the lifestyle? And that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to like to cook professionally and, and, and learn more. Uh, so then I had my, they're like, no, you, we're not going to send you there until you prove to us that you really want to go. And I was like, well, I thought me applying and doing that was going to be enough. So and then I, they, I had to enroll in community college and I, uh, didn't care. I didn't want to be there. So I, I was actually put on academic probation at community college. I, 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 my parents were so pissed. Like they, uh, they tried to follow, like my mom would like follow me to make sure I was going to school. Why? They were to, yeah. So they would like follow me in the car to make sure that I was going there. 
and I would just sit in the parking lot. I, I put a PlayStation 2 on my car with a TV. Like, I had an old 1987 Volkswagen GTI. I installed a TV. Like, me and my friends ran it in. I had a PlayStation and a TV. I would play video games for two hours and then leave and go to work. Uh, but they had no idea. When uh, when they got, like, all the grades out, like, I remember the first day I went, it was, I think it was English class. I walked in. The door was locked because I was, like, five minutes late. I'm like, well, I'm not going back to that class. I never had <laughs> it. I was like, ah, I gave it, I gave it my best shot. The old college try, and that was it. So more than anything, like community college just like further kind of put me away from like the goals that I want. I'm like, I don't care anymore. I'm like, I'm just gonna do this. Um, and then when the grades came out, I had to go like talk to academic advisor because my GPA was zero point zero. Uh, which I, I'm like, Dad, it's like, it's like Animal House. He's like, No, he's like, we're fucking paying for this. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Yeah. yeah. Um, Props to that. That's yeah. Zero point zero. Not yeah. even like a one zero. Oh no, like, no, no, no. Like, uh, I literally did not give a shit. Yeah. And it was, and it, it was clear. Like it took more effort for me to intentionally fail my classes and do no work than to at least try and get some form of like a little yeah, bit put, of credit. Put your name on the exam. Yeah. Get ten points. <laughs> yeah. I just, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't care. I, I was just, I think I was so like just turned off to the idea of school because I, I felt like I never. I mean, I had done so poorly my entire life and just kind of continuing on that same track of never feel like feeling. It was like. I couldn't pay attention. I mean, I found out earlier, like I had ADD or whatever it may have been, but I wasn't, I didn't take medication for it because I just didn't like the way it made me feel. But I, and I, I think I've talked about a lot of other chefs about this too, is that who knows what we would have done. Like, it's not to say that we were flawed, but maybe if there was like a different, different system that we, we weren't just like thrown into like these little, like this, it wasn't like this plug and play thing. You're like, okay, now you're in school, you learn this and you graduate. Like there was, we, I didn't, not to say like I, I needed any kind of, you know, different attention. I just don't, maybe there would have been a, di like if there was a different, a different school, a different system, like who knows what it is. But I feel like that's something that I would want to talk about later on. Cause there's a ton of kids that I see like that struggle. And, like, cause I was there too. And like, they, they not to say they didn't amount to anything, but there was there, they might've had different, different goals and ideas of what they wanted with their life. And then because they just didn't fit into like systematically into this, the education system there, like it just, we all kind of like flopped. And luckily I found a job that, they didn't really require a four-year college education. Like it's not required. Like there's a lot of people that have college educations now that change jobs, come work in kitchens, but it wasn't like I needed, you know, I needed like a master's to be a line cook. Like it just didn't happen. Is there a debate with culinary school? Cause like in my world of, in filmmaking, there's, there's always a debate. Like, do you need to go to film school or you could just like, just start making movies? It's like, yeah. you, like, does that, does that set you apart from the rest of the chefs or like, does that, open the door to larger opportunities if you go to culinary school not i mean i think that's a lot of people not a lot of people require it but they i think they they appreciate if you can go to school and commit to two years saying like this is what i want to i want to do At, we have an active restaurant <laughs> um it was some people some places required it <clears throat> and i think a lot of places that required you to go to culinary school were more like at a corporate structure um, cause some places did like culinary, like they did like tuition reimbursement and things like that. But I'm sure it was like, if you committed to working at this hotel for like six years, we'd pay it off, which I think probably most people have stopped now because that's so much money. Um, uh, but most places I went to, they're like, no, it's not a required, it's appreciated because it shows that you're committed to doing this because most people that end up working in kitchens were just like, they had no place else. it's like, yeah, they were like misfits. They had no place else to go. They landed in a kitchen and it made sense. So making sure that you were that you wanted to be there was probably the reason why they're like okay if they if they went to school it means that this is something they really want to do and they'll at least stay for two years but for me like i don't not to say i don't care like i'm not gonna turn somebody away because they went to culinary school but that's not gonna I'm not, i don't even like i don't even look at their you know the classes they were in and like the honor society like that means nothing to me it's more so who you are as a person we'll sit down and have a conversation for like 30 minutes like half time i don't even i don't talk, like what's your favorite food to cook at home? Like, I don't care. Like I'm not, that doesn't mean anything to me. It's like, what, what are you passionate about? What drives you? Uh, what do you want out of life? Like, who are you as a person? Because being in a kitchen when you're in such close proximity, uh, those, those relationships, just like any, and I'm sure in any other industry, it's important. Like we work in a kitchen that is, it's an open kitchen and it's beautiful, but it's hot as hell. Like it's, we have, we're, we're moving very quickly. Like if you can't communicate with the person next to you and you, and there's a constant, like, there's tension that you just like just cut it's like so thick it's terrible for everybody it's toxic so i i care more about who you are as a person and like what what are you passionate about and where do you see yourself it's not like this like where do you see yourself in five years kind of question but like what what is your end goal like do you want to open up your own catering company what do you want to do like how how can we benefit you because if we're helping you push yourself to get to that end goal like you're going to work 
from like work with me to get there, which means you're going to make sure that you're doing everything as well as you can, because we're, we have a, a mutually beneficial relationship. Like one of our, one of our cooks now is, uh, he's been with me for, uh, let's see, like probably closer to like two years now. And he, he wants to open up a sandwich shop and he's starting doing some of that stuff. I was like, okay, well I'll help you as much as I can give you like ideas of numbers and, you know, help you facilitate that. But, and I'm not asking for anything in return outside of like when you're here, like you're on and you're focused and you work and, uh, we just, we can, I can help you as much as I can. And he's, he does pop-ups on Sundays. Like he's, he did one here one time and it was, it was awesome. Like I, and he also did whatever, it like builds like a relationship with somebody like I'm not doing it to gain anything out of it, but I, we support people that are passionate outside of here because this can't be your own thing. You can't live and die in this kitchen. Like I built it. So if any, if anyone's going to be like, hyper attached to it and, you know, die in this kitchen. It's going to be me, not, not everybody else. Like this is, this is what I fought for and like worked for not. And it, I want them to feel like they're, it's a part of it. But, uh, I, I, there's that saying, it's like, treat it like it's treated it like it's yours. Cause one day it might be, it doesn't mean like this physical space it just means you might be in that position at some point in your life where you have a restaurant, you want people to like respect it and, you know, make sure everything's scrubbed and clean. But this is, this is mine, but I also, I support like, Oh, he also painted that picture. So Adam, who's I'll say him by name, Adam, uh, he, <clears throat> he's working on a couple different sandwich things, but he's also, before he got into kitchens, he was an artist. So we, uh, we talked about him. Like, Hey, like we have a lot of opportunity with empty walls. Like if you want to hang up some of your old pieces or something you've been working on. Um, and then, so we threw it up there too. So again, like we support people with what they love. Seamus, who's one of our newest hires. I've known him for a couple of years as he's been in the industry. He loves photography. He shoots on film for the most part. And he's got the picture that we just hung up in the, uh, in the opening of the, in the restaurant. That's, I think that was in Madrid or Barcelona. And then he's got another one over there and he's just gonna pretty much just frame as many pictures as he wants and hang them up all over the restaurant. Like we want them to feel like they have, they have an attachment here, not just like, Hey, you're doing a really good job putting that food on a plate. Like, but, I think it means a lot when they can put up something that's like they're passionate about. Like he, she shoots film all day during the, <laughs> during service. Like he's, he's just got a camera to share a click real quick. I'm like, Oh, we're busy. But he like takes time real quick. He's like, I just want to capture like these candid moments, which is awesome. Like he sent me some pictures. I'm like, wow, it's like, cause we do, we've done a lot of photo shoots here with it being a restaurant and all the uh, tastings we've done and things like that. But like getting someone to capture this moment where we're all just like working and like just hyper-focused, it's like an entirely different perspective for me to see. Cause I can tell when a camera's looking at me and they're like asking me for it to smile. Like that's a different, a different, uh, it shows a very different side of who we are. And he just captured like these really cool pictures of us. Like my family comes in all the time and he captures like me playing with my daughter or my wife, like talking to the kitchen staff. And it's just like, it's a, it's a different glimpse into what I normally see on a day to day when we see like the, the cameras come out where I'm posing and like have my chin up and smiling. Like it's, it's cool, but he, he loves it. And he's like, I'm just going to keep shooting pictures all day. If you, I'm like, as long as you get your job done, like you can do whatever you want. So yeah, a long story short, like, I don't really care about the culinary school. Like it's, it's good. And it gives you a solid fun. Like if you have no, you know, fundamental base, they can give you that, but it doesn't give you a leg up over everybody. Like just cause you come out of culinary school doesn't mean you're going to be a sous chef starting out, which is, I think a lot of people assume that they're going to be upper management immediately. But for me, it's more important that you understand the entire restaurant from the bottom up before you even, before you even hired on as that, or if, if I have a previous relationship with you. I might consider that, but yeah, I think it doesn't jump you up a notch above anybody else because you graduated from culinary school. I appreciate that you did it and it shows that you're passionate, but um, it doesn't it doesn't mean you're more passionate than somebody else who maybe just didn't have the means to go to the CIA or things like that. So it seems like you set up a pretty awesome work culture here, where it's like it's almost like a like you're a family and everyone. Yeah. Like, how much does collaboration play into it, or like how? How open is, you know, are you willing to take the ideas from the lowest man on the totem pole and like, sure, with, or like, you know, with recipe development and tasting and let's get everyone's opinion. Like how, how do you see that as a, yeah, as an owner? It's, for me, it's like one of the most difficult things to do. And it's, it's something that I've learned is delegating and collaboration are like the two keys to success in a restaurant. Like I, I know that I can't control everything as much as I would like to or think that I do. Um, so delegating to different people, like the front of the house, especially like that is its own beast that I have no, I have not tamed, like doing wine menus and cocktails. It think it's things that I like and, um, and things that I, I understand why we need them. But I've, 
I've learned to kind of, as long as they're creating the vision that's like appropriate for the restaurant, like giving free reign for that. Like we just hired, uh, our, our head bartender, um, Susie from me and my partners have a cocktail bar called the Columbia room. She's coming over here to kind of revamp the cocktail menu and make it more in line with what we do. And then the, the wine menu is done kind of separately, but as far as the kitchen goes, like right now, the ideas are mine, but the, the conversation that we have with people as they're eating and cooking it, like it's, I take everything and everybody says to heart, uh, like we'll put a dish up and I'm not to say I'm never satisfied with my food, but I'm always like my worst critic. Uh, but we'll put it up for everybody to eat. Like whether it's a line cook who just started or one of my sous chefs. Um, and we kind of talk through it a little bit. They're like, and I sit there and I take it like and in my head, I'm like just screaming at myself. I'm like, this is garbage. <laughs> like I, I don't take, I don't take praise or criticism any differently really. It's all the same, but, um, we talk through it. It's like, we were just playing with a dish yesterday and it was this like shaved tendon salad with all, all this other different stuff. We plated it and we did it for a dinner on Monday and it wasn't right. And we're eating it and you know, one, one's like, you know, it, it need, I think it might need a little bit more acid, like that acid that you had in it last time with the pickled mustard seeds was great, but it might need a little bit more. I'm like, yeah, I think you're right. Um, and it's, it's always fine tuning. And I think as the restaurant is still only like in its infancy stages, like it's only seven months, like, and I can say that, like my wife has our seven month old daughter at home. So I see them both kind of growing at the same speed that this is still very, it's still very new and it's still learning who it is. And I'm still learning what I want the food to be. So taking at some point it will be a, a place where we have cooks and sous chefs putting food on the menu not and not separately of me like we'll work on dishes together and be like hey make a dish with squab and we'll put it on the menu um i think right now i'm just trying to define what the food is because i think it has to be you know like the restaurant when people ask like what kind of cuisine do you serve and we say modern american because it is the most vague term that we could say because the longer answer is that the food is me it's a combination of all my different travels, my life experiences and the flavor profiles and textures that I like, but that's, that doesn't fit into a, you know, a, a single category of like, okay, so you cook Spanish food. I'm like, no, like, well, you like Japanese ingredients. I'm like, yes. They're like, oh, so you cook Japanese food. I was like, no. Uh, so new American is the easiest way to say I cook whatever I want because that's who I am. But in that same breath, like it makes it a lot harder for people to say, we should do this and put this on the menu. I was like, well, I don't know if that necessarily fits with, who we are they're like well who are you I was like we're me so trying to define that into a into actually like into words and like for cooks to understand like i think they're starting to understand like who i am and how i like to flavor and how i season things and then from there on that we can kind of grow and push it but it's huge like we're slowly building up those conversations internally like between my sous chefs so like hey like i don't think you're gonna you don't think you're gonna like this like through one of the preps, like it didn't turn out the way that we that it normally turns out. And we'll taste something. Like, yeah, you're right. I, I don't like that. They're like, okay. And it's not because I specifically said that's not the way I want it. It because a lot of the stuff we do is kind of very natural and organic, and it's there. We have base recipes, but products are different every single day. Like I think this, like one of the the like the tenant salad, like one of the the ingredients is like it's just this green juice, and it's a combination of all of our different herbs and plants and uh, things that we have from our farmers. And it changes on a daily basis, depending on what we have more of. And yesterday we did with some cabbage that we had, uh, and it, it just didn't taste the same. And I'm like, is this okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm like, this is good. It's not as good as the one we did on Monday, but it still fits the dish and what we want to do. And then there might be the one that we do today might be better. Like who knows? Like it, we're, it's always kind of in flux and tasting and how do we adjust in season? Like there's not a standardized recipe for everything that we do here. Uh, for the like for like for sauces and stocks, like, it's a lot of touch and that's how I, that's kind of how I judge a lot of cooks. It's like how I see you touching food and how I see you tasting and how I see you seasoning. Um, you can be delicate and firm at the same time with that kind of stuff. What do you mean by touch? You so, I mean, it's the way that you handle like a piece of meat when it's in the pan, the way that you, you bring a sauce up, like, do you just boil the shit out of it and burn it? Or are you gently kind of like in the middle, like while you're working, like just kind of stirring and make sure it's not scorching. Like there's, an elegant touch that you can have. And it's like, it's being aware like of the, of everything that's going on rather than just like cooking a piece of lamb and cooking that till it's finished. And then they're like, Oh shit, I need to grill this. And just like throwing a piece of fish on the, like on the fire. Like it's, there's, I think it's, it's like this weird gentle yet firm touch that we, that we have. It's really, okay. Yeah. Like, and it, like it might, how you grab it with tongs or how you're, flipping, we don't have tongs on like the wrist or yeah, like it's, there's like, we don't have tongs because I feel like tongs are like, we do use obviously like tweezers when we're grabbing something off of the fire just cause it's, 
it's uh, easier or you use two spoons to kind of pull it off. But anything that's just like, for me, like togs, it's just like you just squeeze the shit out of something and it just like destroys it where with everything else, it takes a little bit more delicate touch. Like it needs, it's again, delicate and firm. But the way you, the way you flip a piece of meat in a pan, if it's, if it's like we have a lamb dish and it's got it, the skin's got to be crispy and it's got to be caramelized and it's sometimes it sticks to the pan. Like it flips when it's ready. If you force it, you tear it and it looks like garbage. Then when you baste it with butter, if it's not frothy, like it's, there's so many different elements to that make it. Will will the guests notice the difference? Maybe like it. It might just taste super fatty because the butter's not frothy and it's just kind of seeped in to an already fatty piece of meat, and it doesn't have like that crisp. So when you put the sauce on top, like it just has a different soft texture. I and mean, just the way you sauce it, like are you glazing it so it's hitting all the like all the outside, so it's just completely co like covered in this super dark berry sauce, or are you just putting a little bit on top and letting it drip off and then kind of haphazardly throwing garnish on it? Like there's there's like little little things that again most guests do not notice but i notice it but i also notice when my cooks do it the right way and i notice my cooks do it the wrong way and it's like a subtle it's like just a little coaching it's like it's not like don't ever do that again kind of thing it's like hey when you do that like don't don't move the protein in the pan so much move the pan let it get color and then flip it gently with this and then just let it go i'm like you don't need to touch it a million times like just let it be what it's going to be and you see the guys that just like shake pans and they're like moving around really quick like they think they're doing more when they're actually really doing less um so yeah but there's there's a little a little finesse like if you're i think i've learned as i've gotten older like i've i've been working in restaurants since i was 15 and i'm 33 now that you're more efficient if you can if you can work your station literally just staying in the same space and just turning around back and forth because you've set yourself up so well like that's that's smarter rather than like running to the back every five minutes because you forgot something in the fridge or like I mean, working in the kitchen, there's not, a, there's never an ideal situation where you can just literally stand still the entire night. But yeah, how much like mise en place do you have, like yeah. ready to go? Yeah. So, if, but if you can be smart with your movements, like I move a lot because I, I expedite, I run food, I run back and forth to make sure stuff. Like I, 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 I count my steps now, and it's kind of ridiculous. But if you're as a cook, if you can stay on your station and just not run back and forth and just be there, like that's another like your, your mental approach to how you cook. It's like being prepared. It's like yeah, having your having your having everything ready. Like if you're set up and ready to go, you're gonna have a great service. But if you forget to do like the three things that you do every single day, and then it's just like great. Like you didn't temper butter, you didn't temper this, you just temper that. Now you're gonna be behind. It might only put you behind from opening 15 minutes, but I feel like that affects the entire night. Like you're always just trying to catch up. Like there's, and it's just you're not in a good mental headspace. Could you talk about recipe development? Like yeah, does it start with? I've, I mean, I have no idea how you even start a recipe. Like, you, you're at a, another restaurant, you have this great dish, you're like, I want to do something like this. Or you start with a single element and say, what if we change this? Or is it just like you're sitting on paper? Yeah. Like, um, how, does that, how does it even start? I mean, it, it comes from a lot of different places. Like, there, there are moments like being in somebody else's kitchen where you're inspired by seeing like, an ingredient or a technique that they've done. Or you're going to the farmer's market. It always, for me it always starts with an ingredient because I've learned doing it the other way. It just doesn't yield the same result. Like if you're trying to use like a cool technique and you try to fit ingredients into it, it doesn't always, I feel like it doesn't always for me at least doesn't work. Um, so it's starting with whether it's the lamb or the beef or like this beautiful vegetables, like it starts with that. And then you kind of let it do whatever it's going to do. Like you don't, I don't always have a dish in mind. I have, I have an idea of what I want it to be, but the one thing I've learned is that, the, like the more concrete idea that you're trying to work with the it's you're usually going to result in failure it's like kind of well, grasping smoke a little yeah. bit like the harder you try to yeah you're, you're trying it. to make something something happen and you're only chasing that result yeah. and if you're only focusing on that and you're just like it's linear you're just looking at that you're not seeing all the different ways that it could go uh that it might be better than what you're trying to make it like there's a lot of happy accidents that happen in restaurants like it's if you're just solely focused, if it's simple, it's like, yes, I want to make a cheeseburger. Cool. That's, that's simple. But like we have a cheeseburger on the menu and it's delicious. There's definitely like a lot of really cool elements to it that most people don't see. But like we're, we have a lot of dishes that kind of change through over time. Like they just evolve into something else. Cause we don't just limit it to being that one thing. Like it's uh like we have a, a green tomato dish on the menu right now. It's green tomato water that's infused with jalapeno habanero. And it started with getting in the green tomatoes. Cause that was something that was like seasonal and around and, um, we kind of just let it kind of be itself. We're like, okay, we can do fried green tomatoes. We can do this, we can do this. So you like build a database of all the possible things that it could be. And you're like, what is the, what's the one that we're the most excited about and the most happy about? 
and it was the clarified green tomato water. Like, cool. What would that go with? Like, it's kind of spicy. It's kind of citrusy. So right now it's going with uh, kampachi, which is like this really beautiful fish. But I was just talking to my sous chef, like, like I love that green tomato water, but I, I feel like it's playing like second fiddle to like the fish. Like no one knows the, how great it is because they just, they think it's a dipping sauce. So like, well, what if we just made it made the focus be on the green tomato again? And or the, now that we're getting into like the season, we're going to start probably seeing that a little bit more. Like, what about like the the cherry tomatoes that our people are starting to pull out? Like, what if we just made it about tomatoes again? Um, so yeah, we we try not to limit it to what we originally think it's going to be like, just let it kind of roll and be a little more natural. And which I think is frustrating to some people because they, they like to have like a clear, they're like, what is my finish? What's my starting point? And what's my finish line? I was like, well, there isn't one. It's always kind of in flux. And I'm not the chef that like changes things on the fly, but if it's adding something to a sauce, I'm like, okay, let's in the middle of service. We changed something last night and it was a new dish and I wasn't happy with it. So in service, like, hey, do we still have the toasted hay powder that we just made the other day? And they're like, yeah, like, let's put that into the sauce and then strain it out. We'll use that. And it changed. It made it, like, brighter and it was delicious. They're like, oh, they're like, so is that what we're doing now? I'm like, yeah, I guess so. Like, it's, it was, it's a, it, there's small little, like, adjustments. But, it, I mean, it starts with an ingredient. We test it and kind of see where we want it to go. Like, are we going to do it raw, cooked, steamed, blanched, fried, uh, charred as shit? And will you go through all those iterations for like the most part like oftentimes like we, we don't have like an r d budget where we can often afford to like let's get in 50 pounds of this and just see what happens um but i've been fortunate enough like this is what i've been doing almost my entire life so i already have a database idea of, like and i've been in dc for so long like i know a lot of the ingredients and i know how they react to certain things so it's it's kind of grasping me at previous failures or successes and not trying to repeat myself but knowing that okay that works really well with this let's try it maybe this way and try it with something else so um it's not something that i've ever like written down as far as like this cucumber is the best when it's you know salted at three percent and left at like five days and then roasted like it's it's never anything like that but it's i think it's like more of a an internal you know just you build up like these skill sets and i yeah, just kind of working know. knowledge yeah yeah <clears throat> so it's and i know and oftentimes like there's things that i've tried that were like absolute garbage and it's probably just because i wasn't not to say I wasn't focused on it, but maybe I just, I kept pushing on it too hard. So after like two weeks, if it doesn't work, even after a week, I think I gave up on it and let it sit for a while. And we've gone back on those ideas and kind of built on them and they've evolved and grown into something else, but I never, never like discard failure. Cause those typically will be like some of the better ideas. Like it's, if it just, cause it doesn't work the first time, which it typically never does, doesn't mean you should just like discard it. So we usually, I usually hold those for myself. I'm like, okay, I really like part of that. Most of it was garbage, but it, I like the idea behind it, so we'll keep working on it. So it's, uh, yeah, trying to, I have screwed up a lot of things in my recipe development. I think that's why, how we've gotten as far as we have is being being okay with failure and taking, I guess, and also like failure is like a pretty shitty word for that. It's like, because that makes it sound like it just, it was a, like didn't work at all. And she just wasn't right at the time or maybe at the moment. Overall wasn't a success. Yeah. Like. Yeah, let's go with that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start using that. Be like, overall, you were not as successful today. Um, but yeah, because failure just has like a negative connotation to it. Like it just sounds like it's garbage. But oftentimes that's not the case. It just maybe wasn't right at the time. Mm -hmm. So, And um, will you go so far as to test it with guests at the restaurant? Like um, will you say like, we're not 100% sure about this recipe. Let's put it in front of some customers to see what they think. Or or you keep it very like safe inside the kitchen Real like we know this is good now we're going to present it oh. i mean if there if we have a friend that comes in the restaurant be like hey like we'll give him a taste of it because we're not gonna <clears throat> just give it to like a random person mainly because we don't want that to be like if it's not good and they don't like it we don't want that to be the impression of what the restaurant is but we've definitely like had friends that work in restaurants like here try this real quick They're like oh that's awesome I'm like all right cool like, it's it's we like to keep it open let a lot of people try it and we let like the front of the house try it we'll let the back of the house try it um and kind of see where it goes but most of the time we won't put it on a plate and put it on the menu until it's ready. And even that, like once we consider it to be ready and like menu worthy, <clears throat> we'll change it and manipulate it like a bunch even before that. Like it's not to say it changes every day, but there's always these little tweaks after like, it's easy to create one perfect dish, not even perfect one dish that you're happy with to put on a menu. And then when you start getting into like, how do we do 30 of these a night? It changes your entire process. So you're like, okay, this is ridiculous and stupid. Like it's not going to work. Um, 
not in the, the setting that we have. Like we don't have 30 hands doing one dish. So how do we make it still same flavor, same finesse, but easy for us to replicate in a restaurant scenario? Like I can make a beautiful picture and put it on my Instagram account, but how do we make sure that every dish that we give to our guests is exactly what they see? Cause I mean, the, the, that's, I feel like a lot of people see the pictures of the food now. They're like, cool, that's what we want. And then we get here and it looks like reality. Like it's entirely different. Like it's, you're going on a Tinder date and you're like, ah, it's not your picture. Like you look, it's entirely different. Like they have expectations, right? Like it's <clears throat> so making sure that what we're posting and what I'm building it to be is what we, what we sell it as too. Yeah. So how much of that re reputation management is there? with your restaurant like how much are you like you talk about you don't want to put the wrong dish in front of a customer or even like the wrong picture in front of someone yeah like how fickle is like the per public perspective of reverie and like i mean like, i think it's <clears throat> i think it's huge because it's all we really have like we don't have i guess this is the way that people find out about us it's either like oh my friend posts about this on instagram so everything that we have out there whether it's on facebook instagram twitter whatever article we do that's people's idea of who we are uh and it, it's right i mean it's it is who we are so the story that we weave via social media now, which is like, I think one of the most important forms of, you know, making it accessible to everybody is it's gotta be right. And it's gotta be clean. It's gotta be clear of who we are and what we're doing. But yeah, if I put a picture of like a dish that's over the top and extravagant, and then we, when you get here in the restaurant, it's like, like a dot of sauce and nothing. Like it's a disappointment. They're like, Oh, we thought this was something else. So anything that we do in the re like <clears throat> we do in the restaurant phase, if it says like, if I post something on my personal page, I'm like, you know, R and D for this dish. We're trying to figure it out. Like, then that's not people's perspective. Like, oh, okay, they're working on this dish, but if I'm like, it's on the menu tonight. Come get this, and when they get here, it's like, well, it's a little different than what you saw. Uh, but I, we the last thing we want to do is like disappoint or not live up to the expectations that we set. So I think that's that's huge and that's important too. It's uh, um, now that everything's like so accessible, whether it's through you know Yelp or whatever it may be like. Well, like people on Yelp, like they may not, <clears throat> they may not take like the best picture or something. So we want to make sure that all of our food looks beautiful. So when it goes on a plate, even if they're like taking like a really up close picture, like hopefully it still represents us well, because that's how some people look at restaurants now. It's like, well, who's, who's got the strongest Yelp review? Dark iPhone photo. Yeah. A candle. It's like, Ugh. yeah. Yeah. It's not going to live. It's not going to give you the best perception of like who we are, but try to make sure that we kind of can control all those variables. Like the restaurant's very lit it's even at nighttime like there's a lot of a uh, lot of light coming through with all our light we we want people to be able to see their food and it's not meant it's not because we want them to instagram it or whatever it may be but if you can't see the detail that we put into it then why would you even do it but it then also just ends up looking good on camera too because it's like softwood nice light from above like it's not this dark dim uh dining room where you can't see it which i understand why some people do that too They're like you should be in the moment not worry about your phones but I also know the reality that we're in. Like, we can't just like tell people to put their phones in their pockets and not take pictures of it because that's why some people go out. Like, they want to like document what they're doing. So, want to make sure that it, when they're doing that too, like it's sometimes even less about what we post, it's more about what they post because they're gonna send it out there and it's out there in the geotag and you can see it. And like, they're like, oh, it's like, more authentic coming from yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. They're like, well, what the hell is that? Like, that doesn't look like anything that Chef posted. So are they just. They make though they can make one pretty plate and the rest of it looks like shit. So that's that's the that's what we don't want the conversation to be. It's how much? Because for me, when I go to a restaurant or eating food, I take into account more of the experience. Like, yeah, I call it the like from the plate to my mouth. Like, yeah, how is this moment versus like not to say that taste is fifty fifty, but like my biggest complaint is always like the the burrito that you they serve on a plate and you cut it and it just falls apart yeah because the tortilla goes loose and it's like <laughs> yeah how much do you think about that with food or even the atmosphere that you're setting up or like how you know how you're eating it versus what it actually tastes like yeah i mean that's that's a huge thing i mean again like when you talk about like making like a beautiful plate they're like great you have all these greens and herbs and flowers and a swirl of sauce all over it but like how from a guest sitting down at a table is that actually going to taste and like the the functionality of like one of our dishes it's not a difficult dish to eat but it's just maybe a little bit more unfamiliar it's uh we do the collars of the compachi so the fish that we serve raw we grill the collars it's glazed in like this runner peanut miso and yuzu and you get served the entire like it's like the jaw so it's not like a piece of fish just on a plate like it's got bones on it yeah. so i mean it's like if you pick up pick it up and you like a rib it's delicious but not for, for everybody it may not you know, be the easiest, you know, 
dish to attack, but finding a way that we can clean it up and make it easy and, and how we explain them. Like we don't ever want to tell anybody how to eat, but we kind of make it like, you know, you can use a fork and knife or just feel free to pick it up and use your hands. Like we're not that fancy. And I think like setting the tone that we take our food seriously, but on ourselves is always, always makes the approach to whatever the food that we're doing a little bit easier too. Cause everyone's like, Oh, we wanted to lick the bowl. I was like, well, why didn't you? I'm like, feel free to do it. Like you can enjoy it however you want. If that is the best way to eat it, then go for it. Um, yeah, we, we designed the dishes to be like the reason why we cut the duck is we know that we're not going to give a steak knife and a and a whole duck to somebody without it being sliced and having them enjoy it the same way that would it be if we sliced it perfectly for them or same thing with like off the nights if you cook beef like if it's not braised like you want to slice it so the guests aren't they're not like hacking at it because it's going to be it's going to be different like it's not going to be as easy to eat uh they're never going to be able to cut it as well because steak knives just don't stay as sharp. And also like they're cutting on a, on a plate that you know, you're just, they're going to be like scratching to shit. So we try to think about how is this going to eat for the guest and are they going to, it's going to, are they going to enjoy it as much? Cause if it's, you know, beef, you have to cut a certain way, just anything like, you know, you cut against the grain. If they're cutting it the wrong way, they're going to take a picture and be like, look at this piece of meat. It's overcooked. I'm like, well, no, you just cut it the wrong way. So taking a lot of the, the thought on how to eat food, because that shouldn't be something you think about when you go to a restaurant. It should be as simple as just enjoying it off a plate. Um, it, it's something we think about too. It's like how we're like when we design a plate, like again, the tenant salad, because it's the one thing that I'm like, it's destroying me right now because it's not, <clears throat> it's not right in that sense. I'm like, how are you going to get the perfect bite with each fork without having to build it? Like, all right, let me make sure I have one of this and one of this and one of this. Like, how can we make sure that everybody you get has everything incorporated into it? as much as possible without actually building spoons and putting it on there and telling them to do it. So it's something we think about like how intuitive is the plate. They're like, okay, the sauce is in the middle, the greens are on the outside, drag it through the center and eat it. Like, like, is there any room for error in this? Like some not going to understand it. And then, and for the most part, it's, we've, we don't overthink it because I'm like, at the end of the day, it is just food, but you have to think about, is it, is this so out there and different that people are like, well, how do like, I, the worst part is like, well, when a guest looks up, you're like, well, how do you, you know, want us to enjoy this? What is the best way? I was like, oh, if you have to ask me that, then we did something wrong. It should be simple. It's like, oh, cool. I got a bowl. I got a plate of food or a bowl of food, whatever it may be like, eat it. It should never be like this weird. What would you recommend the best way to enjoy this be? Should we get one of everything? I was like, well, you should just eat it. <laughs> That's, that should be the, that should be the only answer that you really need. Tell us about. Uh, where we can find you online yeah. or how, um, how we can find your restaurant. I know it's down like yeah, a dark, so, a dark alley. You can, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's well lit at night. Uh, so Reverie is, it's a uh, 3201 Cherry Hill Lane Northwest. It's in Georgetown. It's off of uh, this one-way street called Grace. We're down historic cobblestone alleyway. Um, you can find us, I mean, you just, if you, it's reveriedc.com. Uh, my Instagram is just Johnny Spiro, J O H N M Y S P E R O, which is easy to find. I post events that we're doing, new dishes that we're doing. Um, I'm trying to get better about posting on my on the the Reverie Instagram as well. Um, but it's I feel like people just because I associate myself with the restaurant that that's the easiest way to find it. Um, we're open every day except for Mondays uh, for dinner only, starting at five. We're, we consider ourselves to be like a casual fine dining restaurant. We take our food really seriously, but not ourselves. It's an open kitchen. We have fun. Uh, we sing a lot in the kitchen for some reason. It's been like a new thing where we constantly break down in, in song during service. So if that gives you a hint of like who we are, like I love food and I love what we're doing, but I also want to make sure that our guests are having a good time and our employees are having a good time. And basically just overall, it's just want to be like a happy place. So if you walk in and I'm starting to sing, just, just go with it. It's cool. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode with Chef Johnny Sparrow. This is season one, episode two of the new series I'm starting. I haven't really given this a name, and I don't think I will give this a name. But if you want to learn more, or if you want to share this with a friend, tell them to check out the Jordan P. Anderson podcast, or go to jordanpanderson.com slash blog. You'll be able to find everything there. Thank you again to Chef Johnny Sparrow for having me. Please go check out his restaurant, check out his work. He is at reveriedc.com, and you go to Johnny Sparrow at his Instagram he does great stuff behind the scenes. Uh, you even see him sometimes collaborate with other great chefs in New York City or in D.C. Now that we've made this episode, my wife and I are booking a reservation ASAP. And on next week's episode, we will have... Well, you just have to find out. Again, if you're looking to find this podcast or share this podcast with a friend, it's a Jordan P. Anderson podcast. The Jordan P. Anderson podcast. 
You can find it on all the major podcast platforms. Type in the search bar, Jordan P. Anderson.